Some people believe the Bible's just a bunch of fairy tale stories that were made up to teach us about God and how God would have us live. But if they were contrived stories about God and his people, I don't think the writers would have made up people who were so flawed to write about. Instead, they would have written about people who rarely strayed from their trust in God, who overcame every hardship, who ran the spiritual race to the end. But that is not what they wrote about. We would never be able to relate to folks like that, would we? Instead, the writers of Scripture were inspired by God to write about real human beings with real flaws, with real problems, just like us. And yet with a reliance and trust upon God that he was walking with them in the midst of their struggles, in the midst of their pain. One of those very real people just like us was Abraham. Even though God had not yet changed Abram's name to Abraham, I will refer to him as Abraham because that's how we really know him. When God spoke to Abraham's heart about leaving the city of Ur and traveling to Canaan where God would give him descendants as numerous as the stars, even though his wife Sarah was still barren, way beyond childbearing years, Abraham believed God. But sometime after arriving in Canaan, a severe famine hit. His livelihood depended on being able to feed the herds of sheep that he had. So he moved his family and his herds to Egypt. Abraham was doing great in his worship of God and in his service of God when things were going well before the famine hit, before he had to transplant to Egypt. And as we begin to look at our message outline, if you have that handout, the first fill in the blank there, letter A, our faith can waver during trials. It's pretty normal for our faith to initially waver when a trial hits us, like the loss of a job or a health issue in our own lives or in the life of a family member, a close friend. But then we need to refocus, regroup, draw near to God so he can reinforce his love for us and increase his trust in us that we are not alone in what we're dealing with. Last week we looked at some things we can habitually do that will increase our trust in God and decrease our worry and our anxiety. If you were not here, that message is online. You can check that out. What's interesting is nothing is mentioned about Abraham seeking wisdom and guidance from God for his decision to move to Egypt. Abraham sees a famine. He realizes the desperateness of the situation, but he doesn't ask God if he should stay in Canaan or go to Egypt. Now, his common sense may have said, if we stay, we're going to die. But Scripture doesn't say he really inquired of God about it. So looking at the situation from a strictly human perspective, he leaves the risky promised land for the safety and security of Egypt. So Abraham, without inquiring of God, takes the initiative into his own hands and leaves for Egypt. I think all of us can relate to Abraham and his humanness. The famine in his situation can symbolize any circumstances that might happen in our lives that threatens our trust in, our dependence upon God. When things are going well, as a popular t-shirt line says, life is good. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, something happens that's beyond our control and hits us like a ton of bricks. Knocks the wind out of us, and we really wonder if we're going to be able to, to even stand up again emotionally and move forward. 
Maybe again, it's a loss of a job, loss of a loved one, broken relationship, horrendous disease or illness. And when these kinds of famines happen, the temptation, like with Abraham, is to flee. It's to run either physically, emotionally, or spiritually away from God and away from others, rather than run to God and to others for the physical, emotional, and spiritual support that we desperately need. And it's so important to realize when we're, we may be starting down that path of straying, As Pastor Ray shared, God didn't create us to be able to deal with life on our own. He created us to be in relationship with him and relationship with other Christians especially. He created us as relational beings. He created us that when we're hurting, not to pull away, that's our human nature, but to draw near to him to draw near to others, to spend time in other healthy relationships with others where there's a mutual concern, a mutual support, where we know they love us exactly as we are with all of our flaws. We know they're going to be praying for us when they say they're going to be praying for us. But when we're hurting, it's so easy to pull away and develop the habit of living in our own little cocoon not seeking the wisdom or comfort from God or from others. And that's especially true of us guys, just the way our human nature is wired, unfortunately. But God calls us to be in relationship as men with him and with other men. We have a men's study, second and fourth Tuesdays, if you're not in the study, guys, I encourage you to consider coming out for that. But trying to live life on our own just leads to more heartache and pain. We see next that if our faith wavers in trials, it leads to letter B. A wavering faith can lead to a lifeless faith. What was Abraham's life like? What kinds of decisions did he make as he was approaching, not even in Egypt yet, as he was approaching Egypt on the way? Were they God-honoring, other person-centered decisions, or were they self-centered decisions? Were the decisions that brought full and abundant life to himself and others, or were the decisions that brought struggle and pain? We find out in verses 11 through 16, read right earlier, much of what Abraham was saying here was true. Sarah was very beautiful. The Egyptians would think nothing of killing her husband so she can be in Pharaoh's harem. And thirdly, Sarah was indeed his half-sister. They had the same father but different mothers. So Abraham was probably trying to rationalize his deception in his own mind. She really is my sister. And yet a half-truth is a whole lie if it is meant to deceive someone. Let me repeat that. A half-truth is a whole lie if it's meant to deceive somebody. Abraham's intent was to deceive the Egyptians so he might live. But once again, God had already promised. He already promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, many descendants. Where was Abraham's faith that God would protect him in this situation, that God would spare his life since he had promised him he would have many descendants, and he was still childless. His wavering faith, his lack of trust in God to fulfill his word, his promise to him, 
now led to fear in his life. And this fear caused him to plot and scheme and deceive instead of telling the truth and relying on God. So Sarah is ushered off to join Pharaoh's harem. Think about that. I wonder how Abraham was sleeping at night, putting his wife in that situation, sacrificing her purity for his own well-being. A lifeless faith, one that's not living and active and growing, has consequences. Not just for us personally, but let her see a lifeless faith also affects our family and others. A lifeless faith not only lacks being a positive spiritual influence on our family and others, it can easily breed a negative influence. It's important to realize there can be horrendous, either physical, emotional, or spiritual consequences to our sin, to our straying, not just in our life, but in the lives of others, especially family. Many of you know what that's like, and you're still dealing with the emotional toll of how you were treated as a child. But God, as we sang, is a good, good Father. He desires and can help to heal those those wounds from our past as we really understand, not just in our head, but in our hearts, just, just how much He loves us. Just how much He cares about us as a loving Heavenly Father can bring so much healing in our lives. Our actions can also, like Abraham's, have long-term consequences in the lives of others. Here's just a few of the consequences of his choices. No sooner did he and his family return to Canaan that we hear of strife between his herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen over the riches they had received in Egypt. It's like family arguments over what each was left in a will. In addition, one of the maidservants that Pharaoh had given to Abraham as part of his payment for Sarah was a woman named Hagar with whom Abraham would later conceive a child, Ishmael. Ishmael would later become the father, not of the whole Arab nation, but two of the northern Arab tribes who were still today, 4,000 years later, sworn enemies of the Jewish people. They are still experiencing the consequences of Abraham's sin with Hagar over 4,000 years later. It's important to realize our walk with God can have such a powerful influence, not just on our kids if we're married and have children, but on future generations. And our straying from God and not living as he would have us live can have horrendous consequences for generations. It's a sobering thought. There's something that's actually called generational sin. It's a pattern of sin or a pattern of behavior that seems to affect generation after generation in a family. And many times that is a spiritual bondage that can only be broken through confession and through spiritual warfare. Paul reminds us in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man, a woman, a person reaps what he sows. There are consequences to our choices in our own lives and in the lives of others. 
But fortunately, the story doesn't end in Egypt for Abraham. And it doesn't end for us when we make lousy choices. Letter D next, in spite of our failures, God is still faithful. Even though Abraham had put his relationship with God on the shelf and had taken his eyes off of the Lord, the eyes of God were never off of Abraham. Genesis 12, 17 to 13, 2 shares. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So Abram went up from Egypt to Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Pharaoh must have pray, paid a pretty penny for Hagar. But God intervened by sending some diseases on Pharaoh and his whole household, which he was able to trace back to the coming of Sarah into his harem. He found out that Sarah was indeed Abraham's wife. Pharaoh then went and confronted Abraham, and it was no doubt very humiliating and humbling for Abraham, a person of faith, to be called out and challenged by unbelieving Pharaoh. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe it was a non-Christian neighbor, friend, or boss. Maybe it was another Christian who challenged you for an action or an attitude that is not God's will for us, does not represent Christ. If you are married, your spouse has no doubt called you to task periodically, or even one of your own children or grandchildren witness you doing or saying something that really isn't appropriate for a follower of Jesus and challenge you on it. It can be quite humbling. My bride of 34 years humbles me quite often. <laughs> and frankly, sometimes I don't want to hear it. I know what she's telling me is true, but I don't want to be called out on it. And that's really where humility needs to kick in. If we're really serious about striving to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, we need to be willing to be held accountable for our actions and our attitudes. I'm not saying it's easy but it's necessary. Why Solomon writes in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man, one person sharpens another. In the same way a knife gets dull from being used, our faith can get dull from trying to deal with, trying to cut through this life and all of its struggles. But God uses other people to encourage us and build us up. And he uses other people to challenge us. If a knife had feelings, it would hurt to be sharpened. They say sharpening a knife requires grinding away a small portion of that steel blade while maintaining a 20 degree angle. There's no way to sharpen our lives, to make us more effective, if you will, in loving and serving God and loving and serving others without grinding away our rough spots. And we all have our rough spots. We need to be open to that constructive criticism or we're not going to be growing in our relationship with God and others in the way God calls us to. 
we're not going to be bearing the fruit in our lives that God calls us to. But when offering constructive criticism to others, we must be careful how we do it. Are we speaking the truth in love or with a critical spirit? Is our motivation to help the person grow or to heap guilt upon them and wound them? We can ruin a knife by not being careful how we sharpen it. And if, even if it's speaking the truth, we can wound a person deeply by how we speak to them. We are to speak the truth, but it must be in love, in unconditional love. I've always liked what I call, I forget where I heard it originally, years ago, the sandwich approach. It's a positive, negative, positive, like two pieces of bread with a meat in the middle. Affirm the person. Deal with what you need to deal with, and then affirm the person. So they're hearing twice as much affirmation as they're hearing constructive criticism. Pharaoh could have killed Abraham, could have killed Sarah and his whole family but believing the diseases he and his family were experiencing were sent by Abraham's God, Pharaoh was probably afraid how God would react if he indeed killed them. So he ordered Abraham to leave his country, take his wife and everything he had given to him as gifts, and just get out of there. If I were one of the source of his struggles, Abraham, to leave the area as soon as possible. So in spite of Abraham's sinfulness and lack of trust in God, God still made it possible for him and his family to leave the area safely and go back to Canaan. God proved his faithfulness by honoring his promise to Abraham, even when Abraham was wavering in his faith. And if we're followers of Christ, when we go astray and then confess our sins and shortcomings and struggles to God, 1 John 1, 9, God is faithful. He's faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us completely from all of our unrighteousness. So in spite of our failures, God will be faithful to lead us to the promised land of heaven because it is a gift of his grace in relationship with him and not based on our striving to be a good person. We see next that God's rescuing of Abraham, Sarah, and his family from the situation in Egypt did indeed renew Abraham's faith and trust in God's faithfulness. Letter E is God's faithfulness should lead us to repentance and restoration. Repentance is a change of mind and heart that leads to a change of direction, a change of lifestyle. We see the change of heart and direction in Abraham in chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Upon realizing God's grace and faithfulness in freeing him and his family, Abraham returns to Canaan, specifically to the area of Bethel, where he had first made an altar to honor God and worship him. This is not a coincidence. Abraham is returning to his spiritual roots where when we mess up and sin and stray from God's path for our lives, when we waver in our trust in God to meet our needs or in his love for us, we also need to return to our beginning place with God. 
And that beginning place for each of us is the cross. At the cross, we see who God is in his nature and character. We see God's mercy, his not giving us the righteous judgment we deserve from a holy God for our sin. We see his grace, his undeserved favor in providing our complete and total forgiveness in restored relationship with him that cannot be earned, but is a gift. We see his unconditional love for us while we were yet sinners and didn't care God even existed. Thousands of years ago, Jesus went to the cross for us personally, that we would be in a renewed relationship with him. We see his faithfulness as the cross is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that all the peoples of the earth will be best blessed through his lineage, through the Messiah who would come through his lineage. So when we mess up, or when life circumstances just knock the wind out of us and we're struggling emotionally and spiritually, it's so important to return to the cross. It's important because we see in that cross who God is. We see his love for us. It's important to be renewed in God's love for us and in his commitment to us. If you're a follower of Jesus and your faith and trust in God has been wavering, I encourage you to pray this prayer. None of us have a straight line, never wavering relationship with God. We all have those times. Just pray this prayer silently. Repeat these words silently to God. Lord, my relationship with you has become pretty stagnant and lifeless. I ask for your forgiveness in straying from you. But today I'm coming home, God. I surrender my life to you afresh. And ask that you would grow me. In my trust in you. And in my relationship with you. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. And Lord, for all of us, as we go through this life, our blade can become dull. Because life is hard. We can waver in our faith and lose our emotional and spiritual sharpness. And Lord, as we choose to spend time with you, time in prayer, time reading your word, time worshiping you for who you are, God, meet with us very personally through these spiritual disciplines. Increase our faith and trust that you are with us, God. You dwell within us. You're as close as close can be. And that you are for us in our struggles. Soften our hearts, God, that we would be open to your correction and to the constructive criticism of others. So that we might strive to be the people you call us to be. And bear the healthy fruit that you call us to bear within and through our lives. It's for your glory and honor we ask these things, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.